presents our activities with your leave. I hope everybody enjoyed their lunch. And um, again, if there's anything we could do in the GIC to make this day even better than it's turning out to be, uh, please do let us know, and we'd be very happy to, to, to try to help and assist in any way we can for you. Uh, we are so happy today to have the absolute best person in Congress for this topic here with us. It, it is a total 150% match if there, if there could be such a number, uh, and I ask my economist friends to excuse me by using that number. But we have today Honorable Matt Salmon, probably known to, to uh, many of you, uh, who was elected to the United States Congress uh, November 2012 to represent the 5th Congressional District. The congressman was appointed by his peers to serve on the House Foreign Affairs Committee and serves as chairman of the subcommittee of the Western Hemisphere. Um, many years in business and telecommunications uh, and before turning the podium over to you, Congressman, um, I just would like to note H.R. Uh, 1613 and H.R. 3, two important bills where, where I think folks in the room would agree that energy is one of the three or four areas in the United States where there could be a strong possibility of growth. Um, and these uh, two bills, one dealing with uh, offshore drilling in Mexico, the other dealing actually with the Keystone Pipeline, are very important for energy interests of the United States and virtually in every region of the United States. So uh, perhaps you might care to say a thing or two about that in, in your remarks. And the congressman is, is, uh, has agreed to uh, let us hear his insights and then take a few questions uh, at the end of his remarks. So congressman, thank you uh, thank again. You very much. It's uh, really wonderful to be here. Uh, tomorrow uh, morning I get to get on the airplane and fly back to Washington, D.C., uh, where it will welcome me tomorrow night by having another snowstorm. Uh, hopefully uh, it won't be the, the last one I, I just barely missed. In fact, our plane took off about an hour before it hit, paralyzed the airport, and uh, a lot of flights were canceled. But uh, I, uh, I want you to know how much uh, of an honor it is for me to be here today and to speak with you about uh, global policies uh, because I, I truly believe that most of us understand that now more than ever, uh, the United States is in a position uh, where we have to act like a global economy. Uh, monetary changes uh, in China uh, affect us here in uh, good old Arizona and vice versa. Uh, when I was in Congress the first time uh, back in the 1990s, I was also put on the F Foreign Affairs Committee, and being the only uh, member of the Congress at the time, and I believe I am today also, that speaks fluent Mandarin Chinese, uh, I was uh, very, very pivotal uh, in a lot of the negotiations with uh, permanent normal trade relations with China, and at the time, uh, China was trying to get into the WTO, and I was uh, very, very uh, loud and uh, supportive of that effort as well. Uh, but to date, I've been over to China uh, somewhere between 40 and 50 times, and uh, have had the opportunity to meet with uh, presidents, governors, uh, all kinds of business leaders. Uh, in fact, when I left Congress, I uh, was hired by a large international public affairs firm, APCO Worldwide, and I was given uh, responsibility over the uh, China offices. And uh, we had an office in Beijing, uh, one in uh, Shanghai, uh, one in Shenzhen, and one in Hong Kong. And one of my very first uh, jobs uh, was uh, really kind of fun and sexy. Uh, I was uh, subcontracted by the NBA uh, to go over for about six weeks and negotiate Yao Ming out of China, which was uh, really kind of fun. Uh, I got to spend six weeks in Shanghai and uh, following the Shanghai Sharks. And uh, uh, HBO Sports did a special uh, about my efforts over there, and it was really kind of fun. Uh, we were successful in getting him into the NBA, and, and uh, uh, he was a pretty good player. Uh, not too many seven foot six people over in China, but uh, uh, he uh, was quite an impressive individual. His uh, mom, I think, was like six foot seven. 
His dad was six foot 11, and they both played basketball, so a real impressive guy. Uh, but uh, I know a lot of folks in our country, uh, when we start talking about free trade, they kind of cringe, and, and then they, they've come up with a, a, a different slogan about fair trade. And fair trade is really uh, putting up borders, uh, walls uh, around America, and not competing uh, the way we really need to, to compete. I've been a, a staunch advocate the whole time that I've been in Congress of free trade policies. And as such, and I can talk a little more maybe in the question and answer period about the TPP, uh, which is the big uh, proposal that's on the table right now, and giving the president uh, authority through the TPA uh, to negotiate these trade compacts, both of which I strongly support and strongly endorse. Uh, I think that TPP uh, will not only strengthen some of our ties with uh, uh, countries that we don't have uh, uh, trade agreements with, uh, like Japan and uh, South Korea, uh, but it will bolster and, and rekindle and strengthen uh, some of the relationships that we have uh, with uh, NAFTA. Uh, and I think that, that that's a really good thing. Um, so given all this experience that I've had with China, the way Congress does things, uh, when I got into Congress, they give me the chairmanship of the Western Hemisphere, uh, which is uh, South and Central America, uh, Canada, Mexico, and the Caribbean. And as such, I tried to uh, bring a different flavor to the last chairman, uh, who really wanted to focus on all the uh, problems with the ALBA countries, uh, you know, Ven Venezuela, Bolivia, uh, and uh, uh, those, uh, I, I think, less than savory uh, governments uh, that uh, have been trying to poke uh, the eye of the United States uh, for the last several years. I decided to take a different tack. I am concerned about the ALBA countries, and I'm concerned about, um, you know, where uh, Venezuela is, especially today, and I've met with a lot of the opposition folks uh, you know, in Venezuela, and I think that uh, uh, the best advocate for really good change right now is actually Maduro uh, himself, uh, who took over for, for uh, Chavez when he passed away. Uh, their economy is in the tank. Uh, they are totally mismanaged, their, their oil reserves. And I think that uh, the people over there uh, are going to be clamoring, as they are now. I think they're going to, you're going to hear a co more constant drumbeat that's going to increase over time uh, for major reform and uh, a, free, a free market system there in Venezuela, and I think that'll be a good thing. One of the other countries that I am concerned about uh, that has been moving in the right, wrong direction in many ways is Argentina. Uh, and I've spent a lot of time uh, working on that uh, country as well. Uh, I did uh, lead a congressional delegation um, last year uh, over to Argentina, Brazil, and Colombia. And, and you know, Colombia, what a, what a wonderful success story. Uh, looks like uh, maybe we're going to be seeing some of those same kinds of successes with Mexico uh, with uh, what we've read over the last few days uh, in the capturing of the most notorious drug lord in Mexico. Uh, I think that's a really, really wonderful step in the right direction. But, but anyway, um, what I want to talk about uh, in, in uh, terms of Central America is the phenomenal opportunity that's there. And one of the things that I focused on uh, right after I took the chairmanship of the uh, subcommittee uh, was energy issues because I believe that there ought to be a major focus to make the entire Western Hemisphere completely energy independent within the next 10 years, and I think it's possible. So one of the first things that I did, we held a hearing on the situation uh, with Pemex uh, in the Gulf of Mexico and the fact that they have all kinds of deep water uh, oil uh, reserves, but not the uh, uh, skill sets or uh, uh, abilities to be able to go and deploy that oil. And so um, after the hearing, um, I uh, met with Doc Hastings, who is the chairman of the Natural Resources Committee, and convinced him that he and I should sponsor a bill uh, called the uh, uh, Hydrocarbon Transcontinental Agreement, uh, which basically is uh, paving the way uh, for Mexico and the United States to be able to joint drill in the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, Mexico was so heartened by the fact that we were able to you know, move that that uh, pre the president, uh, uh, through some of his reforms, you know, he really wants to reform the energy sector, the education sector, the telecommunications sector. And uh, he uh, uh, was able to press through uh, their Congress and then uh, out to the states a constitutional change, which allows for the first time ever uh, the Mexican uh, company, Pemex, to be able to joint drill with Exxon, uh, Chevron. And it it's a phenomenal opportunity. And I think it's going to uh, go a long way. Mexico already has a four point, uh, excuse me, a four percent growth rate. Uh, 
Uh, but I think this is going to do wonderful things for both of our countries in creating uh, not only job opportunities, but cost-effective energy and reduce, reduce our reliance on the folks in the Middle East. And I think that's a good and a healthy thing. I also went over to Brazil and met with uh, Petrobras, uh, which is uh, Brazil's uh, primary oil company, talking about uh, similar opportunities in the pre-salt region. Uh, they were a lot less forthcoming than the people that uh, we talked with in Mexico and a lot less willing to open their doors. But I think they will. I think that, that uh, as soon as they see how profitable and successful uh, and job creating uh, this opportunity with Mexico is, I think that they will, um, they will be working with us into the future. I'm really bullish on uh, trade with Mexico. Here in Arizona, uh, Mexico is our number one trading partner. Canada is our number two trading partner. And uh, uh, we uh, held a hearing in Tucson about a month and a half ago uh, about uh, improving the trade in this region of our country between us and Mexico. And while I think trade issues and the, and the TPP will, will go a long way toward fostering and, and growing trade in a macro way in the United States, here in Arizona, I think our biggest trade need is right there in the uh, uh, portals of entry. Uh, we have some real, uh, I don't know how many of you have ever uh, dealt with it or uh, companies that do deal with it, but we have a real bottleneck uh, at our ports of authority, and it's because of a lack of personnel. And so I am spearheading a letter with the Arizona delegation as we speak, uh, and it's being sent to the Secretary of Homeland Security, and we're asking for 500 uh, new CBP workers uh, here in Arizona uh, with the new uh, uh, allocation of uh, uh, Customs and Border Patrol agents across the country. We'd like to get a good chunk of that. We think we deserve that. And uh, it's extremely important. We listen to uh, uh, some of the produce folks talk about how uh, waiting three and four hours at the Port of Authority to get across the border, uh, they're literally having fruit rot uh, in, their, uh, in their trucks. And I mean, a big loss of money, big loss, loss of business. And we can't allow that to continue to happen. If we're really serious about trade with Mexico, then we've got to put some emphasis on dealing with uh, uh, the ports of entry and making them more effective and more efficient. Um, I also wanted to talk just a little bit about something else that's kind of near and dear to my heart because it's something else I'm really trying to reform, and that is the uh, uh, EB-5 program at the federal level. Uh, Arizona is just starting to realize some of the fruits of, the, uh, of, of that labor, but the EB-5 program is a, is a program where an individual can get a uh, visa to be here in the United States if they uh, put up $500,000, and then what happens uh, is whoever organizes the uh, opportunity for making those contributions creates what they call a regional center. Uh, it might be any number of things. It could be a hospital, uh, it could be a shopping mall, it could be an auto dealership, uh, it could be any number of things, but the project has to create uh, a certain number of jobs uh, for the people to be able to be uh, uh, considered for that program. Uh, but the problem is uh, that while I think it's a good program and I think it's, it, it gives us an ability to spark a lot of investment in the United States, it's painstakingly slow. And the people that they have managing the program back in Washington, D.C. are visa pushers, where what they need are people that understand business plans and understand uh, prospectuses and, and making and return on investment and those kinds of things, and not necessarily just you know traditional visa pushers. So. Um, I was able to get the entire delegation together uh, from Arizona to meet with uh, the top people uh, at State Department who run that program, and uh, we're pushing hard for some reforms. And if uh, uh, we're able to uh, see some movement on the uh, immigration reform, we're hopeful that that would be a big part of, of uh, immigration. A lot of us feel that, you know, on the immigration reforms, it ought to be more of a meritocratic uh, type of uh, uh, immigration policy rather than just, you know, uh, uh, you know the, the, the traditional way that we've done things. Anyway, that having been said, um, I, uh, I, the last thing I wanted to talk about, it's another energy issue, but right now in the United States, um, because of uh, the new technologies in uh, drilling for oil, directional drilling, horizontal drilling, and then combining that with hydraulic fracking, uh, we've been able to get to shale oil that we never thought was even possible uh, within the last 10 years. And because of that, the price of natural gas is at an all-time low. 
there's a tremendous opportunity right now for us in the Caribbean to be able to take our LNG and our CNG and export it to these countries who have been uh, thus far dependent on Venezuela. And I think for geopolitical reasons as well as uh, for uh, uh, trade issues, it would be incredibly helpful to us. But the Department of Energy, as it uh, has on other things, has been a real impediment. The Department of Energy has the statutory authority to go ahead and grant those permits, but they drag their feet. Kind of like they've been, uh, well, not the Department of Energy, but the, the Obama administration has been incredibly dragging their feet on the XL pipeline, uh, in spite of the fact that uh, numerous scientific uh, entities out there have said that this pipeline is not going to have any, uh, any effect whatsoever on greenhouse gases uh, and, and is an environmentally safe project. Uh, the administration conti continues to drag its feet. And interestingly enough, that while President Obama uh, came out uh, in his State of the Union speech this year and talked about this being a year of prioritization for free trade and uh, TPA with him and TPP uh, as the big trade agreement, no sooner uh, was his speech done than the, uh, pre uh, the uh, majority leader in the Senate, Harry Reid, said, not going to go anywhere in the Senate. So. Uh, we have some work to do, um, and along those same lines, I know you've heard a lot of uh, dialogue about um, the so-called do-nothing Congress. Well, let me tell you something. Last year, the President signed 65 bills into law. I think eight of those bills came from the Senate. The rest of them came from the House. And we have 40 jobs bills right now, 40, that uh, one of them is the XL pipeline that is sitting in Harry Reid's desk. So I hope that we can get a little bit of pressure um, because International trade is incredibly important, uh, and as, as you said, the, the, the purpose of this organization is about dialogue. Well, one of the best ways to foster dialogue is trade. In fact, when I was in uh, Congress before, every year in June, uh, Jackson Vanek would come up. And every year in June, people would get up and just castigate uh, the socks off of China for its human rights abuses. and. Uh, the slave uh, labor or the, uh, the uh, sweatshops over there and all kinds of other different things. Uh, it was an incredibly uh, detrimental uh, type, uh, uh, you know, dialogue for our bilateral relationship. And so finally, we were able to push through uh, permanent normal trade relations. And I remember, because I am a big uh, human rights advocate myself, in fact, I was on the Helsinki Commission uh, the first six years I was in Congress, and I was the chairman of the Human Rights Subcommittee. As you, as you all well know, the, the Helsinki Commission is responsible for security and cooperation in Eastern Europe, the former Soviet Union, and uh, incredibly important uh, committee, especially these days uh, with, uh, you know, with what's going on over in uh, the former Soviet Union. Uh, you can't pick up a newspaper without looking at you know, problems arising over there. But I was the chairman of the uh, Human Rights Subcommittee, and uh, on one of my trips over to China, when I met with the president of China, uh, President Jiang Zemin, uh, I took up the cause of a uh, uh, popular uh, political prisoner named Song Yongyi, who'd been in prison for about a year and a half. And I was able to get him out. Uh, but it was because of dialogue, not because of threats, not because of embarrassment, not because of cajoling. And the one thing that I argued with my human rights advocate friends, which I consider myself to be as well, was that you tell me one relationship you've ever had in your life that you actually improved by walking away from it. You don't. Dialogue is essential. Dialogue is essential with, uh, with China as much as it is today with Mexico. And the best way to foster that dialogue is free trade. And folks, I want to tell you something. Though I think that uh, America sells some wonderful products and services across the globe, the most important thing that we export is freedom. It's free enterprise. It's freedom. It's democracy. It's the things that we hold dear in our hearts. And it is the value of human rights. And I think that that, that kind of dialogue is only fostered by engaging in a free trade system uh, where everybody actually benefits. And it's kind of funny, but you know, I've, I know I've gone to a lot of forums uh, and held a lot of town hall meetings where somebody will get up and start criticizing me about free trade uh, and, and why am I not for fair trade? Why am I for free trade and these free trade agreements? And the first question I'll ask them is, what, what kind of watch is that on your wrist? Is that a Seiko or a Citizen? You know where that's made? How about the car you drive? Did you drive a Toyota or a Hyundai? I mean, there's a lot of hypocrisy. 
When you talk about people wanting to build up walls up, uh, around America, but yet they shop at Walmart, and what, about 95% of the stuff in Walmart is made in China. And the fact is, we live in a global economy. There's no getting around that. And so we, we either better compete and learn how to compete better, or, uh, uh, well, there isn't an or. That's what we got to do. So anyway, that's my uh, speech, and I'm sticking to it. So I will open it up for a question or two. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Uh, what's your uh, opinion about this speaker and wants to do regarding immigration reform? Uh, I guess do we know on a piecemeal basis rather than just doing it in a blanket? Well, I, I, his question is the immigration doing it on a piecemeal approach versus a blanket. Um, I think that the piecemeal approach actually works a lot better. Um, we all kind of learned that these big, ugly omnibus bills like Obamacare, uh, there are 2,000 pages uh, and, and nobody ever really gets to read and understand them. You know, they just don't work. Um, and I think that doing it a more deliberate way and uh, going after it in a piecemeal way actually works quite a bit better. Um, and one of the issues, I, I mean, it's absolutely paramount, is border security. And it's, and it's not just border security uh, at the southern border, but it's also interior enforcement dealing with, uh, you know, visa, uh, people that come legally and overstay their visas, and it's tracking those people that, that, that uh, come to the United States. Um, and I think that the, the, the border security issue is, it's not just about, uh, you know, people that want to come across the border uh, to, to get jobs in America. It's also about some pretty scary people uh, that are crossing the border, uh, some with the, the cartels that are dealing with drugs and guns. Uh, but even scarier to me, that's scary enough, but even scarier to me is the 10% last year that were apprehended at the borders that were OTM other than Mexican. And uh, they're from other countries, many of them Middle Eastern countries. We already know that there are Al Qaeda cells uh, in Mexico. And uh, I'm very, very frightened uh, and, and when I met with uh, the adjutant general, Kirsten Sinema and I uh, met with him uh, about three months ago. Uh, he, you know, he's over the uh, National Guard for Arizona. And I, uh, we were talking about um, emergency preparedness. And it was at the time, you know, we were kind of dealing with some of the aftermath of what went on on the East Coast with the terrible, you know, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, bad weather that had caused so many uh, problems back there. And uh, the earthquakes that we've been seeing and the tornadoes. And he said, you know, we don't really have those problems. I knew that. But, uh, but we do, uh, my biggest problem and the thing that keeps me awake at night is the fact that uh, somebody, uh, one of these terrorist groups, is going to get across the border with a suitcase bomb and detonate it. And you can't take that one back. And so it's in all of our best interests while we're doing immigration reform to make sure it, it all gets done. So we, even though it's piecemeal, I think that there are components that are kind of have, have to go. If, it, if it's going to go, it, it all has to happen. Any other questions right there? With midterm elections coming this year, what are the odds of getting TPA? And if we fail to get TPA, do we risk losing momentum on TPP and TTIP? Well, I believe that the House will pass TPA. It's not a problem. Um, I, I, the House would pass TPA, and it would also, you know, be very, very supportive of the t TPP. But uh, uh, Harry Reid has said that uh, it goes nowhere in the Senate. So, I mean, it's the same old thing. Every, every major reform that we've tried to do, like the RAINS Act, which I think would do incredible things uh, for our regulatory environment in this country. Are you all familiar with the RAINS Act? You, you all know that I think the biggest problem with regulation in our country isn't necessarily the bill that was passed. It's the rules and regs that are passed by the agency that then is supposed to enforce the, the law and the new bill that's passed. You know, the Clean Air Act, um, the EPA then came out and said, okay, we're going to regulate PM10. And Arizona would, have actually, would be actually out of compliance with uh, the, the federal regs on uh, PM10 without one person living in Arizona because of the dust that happens uh, in the haboobs, and it's, and, and it's an issue. So um, the RAINS Act is basically this. It says that uh, once a bill passes and then it goes to the agency to promulgate the new rules and regulations, 
those new rules and regulations have to come back for, to Congress again for an affirmative vote. So there's accountability, and, and you can reaffirm, yeah, that's exactly what we meant, or no, that's not what we meant. I could say the same thing about Dodd-Frank. Um, the, the devil's always in the rules and the regs. And if we pass the Reins Act, it would put some accountability back where it needs to be, back on Congress to say, yeah, that's exactly what we meant, or no, that's not what we meant. But that bill actually sits in Harry Reid's drawer as well. So I, whether it's uh, trade or uh, common sense, there's a lot of good stuff out there that uh, hasn't seen the light of day. They, they sit in Brother Harry's top desk drawer. Any other questions? Hey, Congressman, um, I just wanted to, to thank you for all your work in Washington, D.C. on our behalf. Uh, you're one of the members of our delegation that we really count on, you know, to kind of lead us towards progress and do the right things. And so I just wanted to just acknowledge all your hard work and, and thank you for everything that you're doing for the Valley and the state of Arizona. Thanks a lot, Barry. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. So I have a question. Yeah, fire away. So, so I guess uh, you've, you've highlighted the necessity of uh, focusing on the infrastructure on the border. Right. Uh, what, if you were to charge this audience or others in Arizona, what would be the charge? What would be the call to action, the mission, the, the, the thing that... I think it's the biggest call to action that we have, and that is, I mean, because it's a tangible item that we could actually make a difference on, and that is to, to, to get uh, 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 the kind of resources at the Port Authorities uh, that we can actually keep the flow of commerce going smoothly. And then the other would be on our transportation infrastructure here in the state, uh, you know, to, to complete that Canamax corridor, which to me is incredibly important. Those things uh, will probably be more important than anything in fostering trade between Arizona and Mexico. And I, I think also um, we just need to, uh, to have more engagement, more dialogue uh, with uh, our counterparts in Mexico you know, with uh, their elected officials and with their business leaders. Because I think you're going to see a big renaissance in Mexico. I, I'm actually really encouraged uh, with this current president. I think he's, uh, you know, there were, there were a lot of people that were wondering whether or not he was going to really continue uh, in the past administration and going after the cartels. I think that's been put to rest, uh, you know, after what's happened over the last uh, week or so uh, with, uh, you know, the capturing of probably the most powerful drug lord in Mexico, and it's to this president's credit uh, that it got done and cooperation. And I failed to mention another thing that I'm very, very supportive of. How many of you are familiar with the Merida Initiative in Mexico? Incredibly important. It, it, we, we, we dedicate uh, literally uh, hundreds of millions of dollars to the Merida Initiative, and in addition to trying to eradicate uh, the, the narco traffickers and the drug trade in Mexico. It's also fo focused on rule of law. And that is incredibly important for us as we try to foster better trade relations with Mexico, that the businesses over there realize that the contracts that they sign will actually be adhered to in international law and that they, they you know, you know what I'm saying. It's incredibly important also that um, the, the police uh, you know, that they're not always uh, following you behind asking for the mordida. I mean, that, it, that it's, it, it's actually a, a, a place where the rule of law takes precedent over everything else. And I think that's incredibly important. I also want to say um, that who would have believed 10 years ago, when you think about what we're doing in, in Mexico with the Merida Initiative and trying to eradicate uh, the narco trafficking, uh, and a lot of people kind of throw up their hands and say, it's just too big of a problem. I'm not sure we can accomplish it. Who would have thought 10 years ago even that we could have accomplished what we did in Colombia? Who would have thought that we would have uh, signed a free trade agreement with Colombia and that their economy without drug trafficking, or at least minimal drug trafficking, would be as robust as it is today? It's amazing what happened there because, number one, their political leaders got the will to get it done, and they found a good partner in the United States. So I'm actually working with President Santos uh, the president of Colombia, uh, and uh, trying to kind of use him as a surrogate as we work with Mexico to use some of the principles that we used in Colombia to, to eradicate, you know, the drug culture there to see the same kind of thing replicated in Mexico. But know this full well. The more we squeeze on Mexico and start to eradicate that, that drug trafficking, it's going to be like a balloon and it's going to go elsewhere. And I think we ought to keep our eye on the Caribbean, certainly, uh, you know, Honduras and, and other countries in the region. But um, I'm really excited. I think Mexico is going to see a, a, a trade and manufacturing renaissance. 
uh, like we haven't seen uh, probably in our lifetimes. I think it's going to be very, very exciting uh, as a lot of companies start migrating away from China because of the increased uh, cost of doing business there. I think the, the logical answer is going to be Mexico and right here in our own backyard. And I think those are really positive things. And we in Arizona should be bullish about working with Mexico and other countries in the region so that we can capitalize on that. If we do that, Arizona is not going to have the same problems that we did in 2008 when we were hit so dis disproportionately hard because we focused so much of our economy on home building and retail. If we can diversify this economy into a, a robust international trade in Arizona, we will never have, it's, it's, a, it's, it's an insurance policy that ensures that we won't be in that same boat ever again. And I say that we, our leaders, our state leaders, our federal delegation, whoever the next governor is going to be, has got to make international trade a top priority, because if they don't, we're going to be in the same old land of hurt the next time the economy has a blip. And I'm for, I, for one, think that Arizona des deserves far better than that. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. much. Well, does anybody have any doubt? Do you think there's any passion in that, Congressman? <laughs> I. I uh, uh, very much appreciate, and our audience very much appreciates, uh, Congressman, your remarks and your coming today and to share your uh, insight. Thank you very much. Well, we're going to move to our next uh, panel discussion, which is investment in Arizona. And to do that, I'd like to call to the podium the panel, but also our moderator for that, David Kotak. Um, just a quick few words about David. His full bio is in the... Uh, little bio book we distributed, but he co-founded Cumberland Advisors in uh, 1973. And if his name sounds familiar to you, it might be because of what you've read in the New York Times or Wall Street Journal or CNBC, Bloomberg, Bloomberg, where, wherever. So Fox, Fox Business, he gets there too and often quoted uh, about that. Uh, and uh, truly and really the GIC uh, has the blessing of being a podium many times for central bank presidents uh, throughout the world and also in the United States. So uh, one of the reasons for that is because uh, David, is our uh, former program chairman, uh, has in fact created a uh, platform where they feel comfortable in addressing our audiences and participating in our programs. And David, thank you very much for leading this uh, panel. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Peter. It's a pleasure. And uh, just uh, one comment on, on the remarks we just heard from uh, uh, Congressman Salmon. The Global Interdependence Center's structure since it was founded in 1976 has had monetary and trade as its middle name. Annually, uh, Bill Dunkelberg, I don't I can't see him if he's in the room or not right now, no. Uh, this year will chair the annual Monetary and Trade Policy Conference in Philadelphia. We have done that for, for over 40 years. So it was a delight to hear a pro-trade conversation. And there are very few issues in which the Global Interdependence Center will take a position because it likes to see itself as convener of a, neut a neutral position and therefore foster a dialogue. But I would expect that if anyone came to the Global Interdependence Center and said, we would like to launch a protectionist trade barrier initiative, the board would decide to reject that approach and not sponsor that discussion. So it was a pleasure for us to, to hear it. We are supposed to talk about investment in Arizona 
um, an interesting topic. Now, a little disclosure. Uh, my firm, Cumberland Advisors, is an investor in Arizona. We own shares of companies who's, who trade publicly and do business here, master limited partnerships that do business here, debt f issued by issuers in Arizona, and so we're very interested in discussing investing in, in Arizona in, the, in any aspect you wish. What we'd like to do in this economy of time is to have about 10 minutes from each of our speakers then lightning round conversation, and we'll try to direct that so we can put some energy in it. So why don't we do this? You have bios, so we're going to skip bios and formalities and go in the order in our program. Uh, Kevin, you want to go first? Yeah, I've got some slides. Sure. Are the slides here? You want to do it? Sh shall we do it? I can stand for an hour. <coughs> And you can, you, or do you want to come here? I'll come here. All right, good, thanks. We're, we're, we, we don't want to move a lot of furniture, so we didn't add other tables and chairs, so we'll do it that way. Go ahead, please. Good afternoon. I wanted to uh, just start out with a, with a couple slides and then some comments um, to kind of give you an idea, investing in Arizona, where we've been um, last two and a half years, so you can see the, the um, the significant investment that's come to the state. And then I'm going to give you a little bit of a snapshot into what the future might look like, at least out for the next 12 to 24 months from a state perspective and the ACA pipeline in terms of the opportunities and types of opportunities that we're working on. So okay, here's, here's what's happened in the last two and a half years since the ACA was, was, uh, was formed. Um, 31,000 jobs, almost 32,000 jobs, um, and four point almost $4.4 billion in, in CapEx. So clearly, you know, the first year, 2012, uh, you see the ramp to 2013. And then the last six months have really been in, in partnership with, with Barry and his team and our other economic de development partners. We've really got some significant momentum. So from a, from a perspective and against the goal, our goal for uh, FY14, which ends in, in June, is uh, 13,500 jobs. And you can see we're well on the way to that. So. Um, again, Barry, thank you to you, you and your team you, and any of the other economic development partners who might be in the audience that I'm not recognizing or, or I can't see. So kind of here's what it looks like from an industry perspective. I think this is important because we want to make sure that our industry focus and our pipeline development is in alignment with uh, uh, the core um, sectors that uh, we want to focus on across the state of Arizona. So the good news is manufacturing, advanced manufacturing, a big piece of our pipeline currently. IT and other um, area where there's high paying jobs and significant capex uh, investment in aerospace and defense. And then you'll see healthcare there at, at, at 7%. Those are the really big ones for us. Um, from a manufacturing perspective, I think it's important to realize where are we, t where are we targeting opportunities in that sector? Because it is one where we've got great references here uh, in the state of Arizona and one where we've got a lot of uh, very skilled workers. So uh, most of the, the pipeline, or a big piece of the manufacturing pipeline, is coming out of California, which is exciting for us, and as, as well as the Midwest and Illinois. So um, California, as I go to the next slide, you'll see this just kind of gives you a snapshot relative to where the jobs are located currently and where they'd be coming from. Again, California, big piece of our pipeline, Southwest, you can see, see the numbers. I think the exciting thing for us is, is the fact that um, California is up quarter over quarter by about two, three percent. So we're starting to get traction there. I know, you know Barry was over there and, and some members of his team. So we're really focusing on California. Um, we see tremendous opportunity there given the economic circumstance that, that that state finds itself in. And I think really the key referenceable clients we have here already uh, in, in the state of Arizona. So I'm just going to um, provide a couple of other different comments and perspectives. Clearly from a state perspective, we've come a long, long way. Uh, as, a, as one of the most business-friendly states in the United States. We rank in the top 10 for business climate, and Forbes recently named Arizona as number one for expected job growth. So that's something that we should all be proud of and excited about. Um, everybody's aware of the Apple, the GoDaddy, General Motors, Garmin, and State Farm uh, locations and or expansions, world-class companies that clearly establish Arizona as the place to be. One of the things, though, that I think uh, our teams at, at, at GPEC and, and the ACA are finding out that we're not in the business attraction business per se anymore. 
we really are in the, in the position to have to develop with the companies um, complex solutions to the problems that they're trying to, trying to solve for and, uh, and help them navigate what, what can be a reasonably complex process when you're talking about large companies trying to, to relocate or expand in the state of Arizona. Uh, I'm just going to close with a couple of uh, trends that we're seeing from an ACA perspective. Um, clearly, growth in high-tech manufacturing uh, is, is a sweet spot for us and, and an area where our pipeline continues to build. Um, that's key, again, because those are high-paying, high-capex opportunities for us. International markets are shifting. Uh, I think everyone's familiar with the fact that onshoring is now becoming a high priority for companies, and we are poised to take advantage of that going forward. And export, export markets are growing again, which is really, really, really important from an Arizona perspective. For every $10 million that we, that we export, it creates about 60 high-quality, high-paying jobs here in the state of Arizona. Um, and uh, I'll close with a really exciting uh, piece of information, I think, is that last year, Arizona was up $1 billion year over year from the prior year in terms of export. So again, there's a lot of exciting activity taking, taking place in, uh, in Arizona, and I think as you see from just from the state's perspective, relative to our pipeline, uh, continues to grow and continues to grow with the right types of companies. Um, much like, again, Barry's team, we work closely together, we're focused on those high quality, high paying um, uh, opportunities with the significant capex tied to those things. So um, I think we're in, we've had some great successes, I pointed out, for the, the last two and a half years, but I'm really excited about the opportunity that's right out in front of us because there's tremendous uh, energy in the state around pro-business, and I think that we've got incentives and programs that really set us apart from, from many states. I think Barry would also agree that we've got an opportunity to refine what we have currently in our incentive uh, uh, tool chest and uh, add a few things to really make us, you know, put us on absolutely even, even standing with some of the other more aggressive states that we compete against uh, in each and every one of these large deals. Thanks. I'll switch seats and ask Barry to go to the podium. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. And we're, uh, makes our job a lot easier having a state agency with some resources. So we've been very grateful to the governor and uh, the legislature for providing us good colleagues like the ACA and giving us some resources because, you know, when we're up competing for these big investments, uh, it's a state and region competition, not just a region competition. So we're really excited about that. Is this a clicker? Because I don't remember anyone giving me the, like, yeah. mm. one on top. One on top. There you go. Thanks, brother. Okay. So what I thought I would do is, you know, lay out a little bit more. You know, Kevin gave you a kind of an overall market position. And I thought I would talk a little bit about foreign direct investment and exports. And I agreed with Matt Salmon. I mean, one of the big aspirations we have for the ACA is that they become a big player in exports and foreign direct investment because it's too hard for a metropolitan region to do it. It's a lot easier for us to follow a state agency in international markets because international markets, they want to see the governor. The ironic thing about international markets, they like elected officials more than they like CEOs. So if you want to go into China, instead of bringing a CEO, if you bring a couple of mayors with you, that's a bigger deal. Uh, and that's because the mayor of Shanghai and the mayor of Beijing, you know, they're the party leaders and the governmental leaders in those markets. So um, some of our goals on FDI by 2025 in working with our, our uh, colleagues at the AC in the region is to be a top 10 market for uh, innovation and product commercialization. Uh, we want to create this world-class delivery system, which we're starting to get underway with the new uh, partnership of the ACA. Um, and we want to become a global FDI and trade leader. And I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, FDI and trade. Um, you know, we've built, uh, when I came to GBEC in 2005, we had zero foreign direct investment activity. I think over a three or four year period, we had like 16 leads. And uh, a lot of people have a hard time wondering, like, why are you in China? Why are you in these international markets? I mean, Kevin will tell you, whenever you make the trip, the press wants to know how much you spent on a glass of wine and where you stayed. And it's always kind of a gotcha experience because when you travel internationally, people automatically think, you know, you're having fun. And um, to, I can honestly say I rarely have fun when I travel internationally. I usually have jet lag. I eat some food I don't want to eat. I don't sleep very well. I work too hard, and then I come back and wish I got to see the community more. So, you know, when we go in the markets, a lot of times – 
Um, I mean, I don't really recall going into an international market and actually visiting anything because you're there, it's a rare moment, you work really hard and you're trying to get through it. So um, obviously we want to you know, help firms in key industries uh, tap into North America and international markets. We want to position the region as an international place and then we want to put a big emphasis on talent. So when international companies look at our market, it's usually a research and development talent play. Uh, if it's not a research and development and talent play, it's a customer play. They're coming into the market because they have a major customer here, they have a major supply relationship, or they want to sell their product into this market. So it's like Kevin is saying, it's very much a business modeling exercise and understanding where are the gaps and strengths in your market and, and where does that told. We just came out, we're vetting the report. We were ranked eighth in the country. Uh, in exporting technology products. I know no one would think of Greater Phoenix as being eighth in the country in exporting technology products, but that's a big lift in the chip and semiconductor. And I think with the glass manufacturing by Apple doing their Sapphire Glass in Mesa, um, I've seen some, some statistics where 50% you know, of the world's glass is going to be manufactured in Mesa because of the volume of glass that's going to be produced by Apple. So that's going to in turn translate into an export position. And the key thing about understanding your export position is it gives you what your foreign direct investment position is. So if you looked right now at FDI in Arizona, you know, we're, you know, I've seen us ranked as high as 14th in our trade position, but our foreign direct investment position lags. And if you look at most markets, foreign direct investment positions and trade positions are fairly similar. So California will be one in trade, two in FDI, Texas will be you know, one in FDI, two in trade. And so uh, we've gone right down to where in some cases New York is four and four, Michigan's five and five. So these states almost mirror their trade and FDI position. Here we do not. Our FDI position is well behind our trade position. And we should be able to rationalize that or organize that. But just to give you a couple of reasons why FDI, the wages are typically about 30% higher than the national average because these are companies that are, you know, are coming in looking for technology relationships and talent. So it's a more sophisticated part of their business model and their wage rates are higher. And if we could just normalize our FDI and trade positions, getting to the top 10 would be 141,000 net new high wage jobs to Arizona, which about 70% of those would be in our region. So it's really a high wage job strategy uh, as well as anything else. Um, these are kind of our FDI results between 2007 and 2012. As you can see, uh, Canada is not just number one in hockey, uh, but they're also number one. This is the first time I haven't liked Canada. You know, I shouldn't have came up here today. I just want to say, Glenn, I don't like Canada anymore. <laughs> yeah, I wanted one of those medals, and you took them both, and I just thought it was stingy and greedy. So, the, uh, but Canada is a major investor of FDI here, but you can see Germany is too, and you know, Spain has been a huge capital investor. China is 10th and slow on FDI, but China is our number three trade partner. And so, you know, part of this, you know, is very, it's a very complex business model to evaluate because, you know, you go into places like Japan, which, you know, if you look at that, we should be doing really well in Japan, especially with our trade position, very tough sales cycle, extremely expensive. So coming up with strategies is always a little bit different. Uh, for this market because, you know, from an economic development standpoint, you have affordability and timetables to get into. But obviously, uh, Canada is our big producer. And then after Canada, it's Western Europe. And I really do think uh, we could be doing a much better job in Germany. We have a big emphasis on Canada. Uh, we have a road show coming up in Vancouver uh, that we're excited about. I just came back from uh, Calgary and Edmonton. And, you know, starting to I think the Vancouver market uh, presents a big opportunity for the Valley. Uh, there's other options in Canada, like foreign, like our, not just capital, but things like direct flights. So we have to be a little bit more strategic and a little smarter tactically. Um, I'm hoping China will come around. Um, I was a lot more optimistic about China a few years ago. I think sustainability issues in China are, are very significant. I'm not sure if we're going to get a bilateral trade agreement. You know, the amazing thing is about FDI and trade is these, foreign, these uh, free trade agreements 
are pivotal to the performance of these markets. When they get done, it absolutely changes the condition between the two markets. So one of the things that would be very helpful to our efforts in China would be a bilateral trade agreement. And um, I think if we were probably more progressive on the gas and oil pipeline capabilities of Canada, that would probably help us as well on an FDI and trade standpoint. Uh, why Canada? Obviously, uh, major greenfield projects. Canada's put $35 billion recently into the U.S. Um, and, of course, in our market, I won't steal Glen's thunder, but, you know, uh, the Canadians have a huge uh, civic and cultural presence in our community as well. Uh, China, I think, is really interesting. Uh, we have a lot of access in China. We formed uh, with the Arizona Commerce Authority a China uh, Arizona Alliance. Uh, we have an office in Shanghai. Uh, we have trade and FDI professionals that we contract with in Shanghai. And we go to China probably two or three times a year. Uh, when the renewable market was a little more promising, we were there more because the Chinese have made staggering investments in renewable. But you know now uh, that conversation with China is around things like information, communication, technology, software, uh, and uh, materials. So it's going to be interesting to watch what, what takes place in the next five years uh, with China. To be honest with you, um, I have no idea what that's going to look like in five years because China is so incredibly volatile right now uh, politically and economically. So, um, but we know it's going to be the biggest economy in the world by 2025, so we will stay there. Uh, we'll hit Western Europe hard now that the financial crisis is kind of limited. Uh, we're going to put a big boost in Germany. These are our secondary markets. You hear a lot of talk about Mexico. Mexico is probably more of a trade opportunity, a branding opportunity. You know, we've had over a million people from Mexico last year come to Phoenix for tourism. So, you know, Mexico is a big business opportunity, but you're not going to see a foreign direct investment play out of Mexico. But it's also the fastest growing Latin American economy. So when you hear Brazil and Argentina, Mexico's economy is uh, far more dynamic. And some of the reforms that the new president has put into Mexico has been staggering. I think as Mexico privatizes its energy market and gets more reforms in place, mm -hmm. labor reforms, you're going to see Mexico explode. Uh, some people project Mexico by 2025 to be the fifth biggest economy in the world, and it will either pass Japan or Germany by 2025, and I think that makes it a really exciting story for us as a border state. And then, of course, you know, from a marketing standpoint, you know, obviously we continue to do digital grassroots. Uh, you know, it's a big network play. We work with investment trade agencies that are in California and abroad. Uh, we work with entrepreneurs. It's, it's a, you know, it's a very tough selling mo uh, model because it's kind of complex and slippery. So with that, I'll, I'll end. And I know we're going to have questions later, but I'll, uh, I'll look forward to having Glenn come up and uh, talk a little bit with us. Thank you, Barry. Well, we've talked about Mexico. We've talked about international areas around the globe. I'll try and put some perspective into the overall Canada-U.S. relationship and then try and narrow it down into Arizona with a little bit of history and a little bit of flavor of where we're at right now and see if I can do that. Other than two great hockey teams, Barry, you're absolutely correct. Uh, Canada is the number one uh, export country for 38 states in the Union. Um, the number is about $1.4 trillion a year in bilateral trade, foreign direct investment, and tourism. The important number, as Barry pointed out and other speakers have pointed out before, is the financial stability of Canada. Four of the top 12 banks in the world are Canadian. And I think that that says something, that it's also the largest energy supplier in total to the United States. So this is a self-eating watermelon. Uh, Canada and the U.S. have got a very symbiotic relationship that rolls money in and out of each country back and forth. We're watching right now Canada and Mexico over the years become extraordinarily good friends. We just finished watching a prime minister and two presidents meet and the main topic of conversation between Canada and the prime minister and the president of Mexico was a direct flight from Calgary to Mexico City to talk about energy and I'll get back to that in a few seconds. I think that's important. Also remember that the largest pipeline company in Mexico is TransCanada, the same one that Matt Salmon referred to that this current president can't see fit to put the 81st pipeline in place where the other 80 have been put between the two countries. So we're also looking at Scotiabank in Mexico with 
the, the ownership of Banco Norte. So we see Canadian interests in Mexico. We see very strong Canadian ties with the United States. And we're watching the energy platform evolve more and more. As Arizona has had a history with Canada, it goes back 70 or 80 years with the agrarian Western Canadians coming down here to hang out in Apache Junction in Yuma, et cetera, et cetera. That then moved into aerospace, where the two aerospace industries in Canada and the state of Arizona are completely intertwined now, and they make things together at a very, very high clip. We also now watch trade, but the trade numbers go up and down 5 6%. Those, those are jumping up and down for me. What is really making a difference right now is foreign direct investment. And the amount of foreign direct investment that we're watching come into the state of Arizona from Canada. Remember this long history of Canadians coming down here. During the recession, the purchasing of these houses was very painful for Arizonans, but it embedded a Canadian psyche into the community by buying these homes. And it's not just people that are in their 60s and 70s. There is a whole new crew of 30s and 40s. There is a whole new movement of companies from Canada. Remember, every company in Canada has to have a U.S. operation. We're now starting to see regional offices, offices open up in Arizona and headquarters open up in Arizona as they bounce off of California for reasons that are to themselves. And as they start saying, you know, we live in Toronto or Montreal, it's snowing in Secaucus, New Jersey, let's go over here. By the way, I now have a house there. So we're seeing a, a very tourism equals trade, which equals foreign direct investment occur, which brings us to the point where now about 300 Canadian companies are operating in the state of Arizona. That's a very large force multiplier as it moves into investments into the state. 2014, we're watching our estimates right now are about a million Canadians coming into the state of Arizona. 35 million people in Canada, 44 million visits to the United States. We're only getting a million in Arizona. And yet our benchmark, if you go back 10, 12 years ago, was about 150, 175,000 Canadians. So zero-based budgeting ourselves as a state, we're growing exponentially. But when we look at market share, we're not doing fantastic. We're, Florida gets 4 million. Another two million go into Nevada, another two plus million go into California. So there is room for growth in that. The same thing in tourism. Our footprint is between six and ten billion dollars of FDI and trade that come in and out of the state of Arizona. That doesn't even come close to registering on a 1.4 trillion dollar number. So that means that while we're all excited about this Canadian activity that's going on here, this is still the tip of the iceberg that can come here. And Canadians are paying attention to Arizona now. Arizona sits in boardrooms as a major point of discussion. And that is something that as we watch this occur, we're starting to see companies like mine, that I'm chairman of the US operations of an Edmonton-based company called Epcor. We've invested just under a billion dollars in the state of Arizona buying water companies. Or how about Fortis out of uh, Newfoundland, of all places, just making a bid for 4.3 billion dollar purchase of Tucson Electric Power. But then there's Bank of Montreal buying M&I, split between the Midwest and Arizona with about two billion dollars worth of assets sitting here in people, money, et cetera. So we're starting to see the, these things are starting to grow more and more and more. TransCanada has a huge operation down in Coolidge. They're expanding operations and pipelines down in southern uh, southern Arizona. Mining. We're watching Canadian mining companies expand in Arizona even though, as was mentioned before, our regulatory environment is not favorable to extractive technologies. These Canadian companies are still coming here and they're still going to work to try and do that. Now, what I am really fascinated with as, a, as an executive, when I watch, I look for trends. I see younger Canadians coming down. I see foreign direct investment coming down. I see companies moving regional offices. I see companies moving head offices. I am even more excited about what's going to happen in northern Mexico. Right now, Canadians are very deep in extractive mining in northern Mexico. We are going to watch, I believe, Canadian oil and gas and LNG companies out of Calgary start paying attention as Mexico allows for this to occur. And I believe we're going to start seeing straws that are going to come down from uh, Arizona into northern Mexico, which puts Arizona in a perfect prime position to be a staging point for extractive technologies 
oil and gas and LNG, and yes, aerospace. As aerospace nearshores to North America, it's going into northern Mexico. And the supply chain of 1,100 plus companies that we have sitting here in Arizona will start interfacing with these companies more and more. So we're going to start to see what I believe Canadian companies like mine are already seeing. Arizona is a hot market. It's a great market. Canadian companies are coming here and they're investing in capital infrastructure because they believe in the growth cycle that Barry and Kevin are talking about. They absolutely, in the boardrooms, buy into this and they're stepping up and they're saying that area needs capital improvements, it needs capex, it needs P3s, it needs institutional investment and it needs infrastructure. And they're walking in and moving their money in here. And this is discussions when you're sitting in Brookfield's or Omer's or teacher's office in Canada where I hang, I'm hearing Arizona more and more and more, and I'm hearing other states less and less and less. So I think that we're gonna see this staging area for Northern Mexico and Latin America, Arizona has an opportunity. And there's a little mountain range in Northern Mexico between Texas and this other area of Mexico that causes a little bit of kerfuffle for, Me for uh, Texas that Arizona has an opportunity to step up and, and jump in. So I'm very, very bullish from a Canadian point of view and I'm very excited to say that Canada, Canadians love Arizona. They love it as a place to live. They love it as a place to play. And they're now coming here with their corporate checkbooks. And they're putting more and more FDI into this market. Thank you. We, we've had the presentation on how optimistic we are and how the outlook is so good. So uh, the job of an economist, besides sitting in the no smiling section on the airline, is to ask a few questions. Let me ask a few and then we can open up a discussion. The short term interest rate in the United States has been zero or near zero for five years. The credit rating of Mesa and Phoenix and the state of Arizona is approximately a double A, which is a fairly high grade credit by the rating agencies. Today, two hours ago, the taxable bond, long-term bond issued by Mesa in a Build America bond structure was yielding 4.7 for its longest maturity. Phoenix a longer maturity, 4.8, taxable. Arizona, tax-free, long, longest maturity that my trading desk could find two hours ago, was yielding 3.85. And the United States Treasury 30-year bond was yielding 3.7. Zero short-term interest rates. And interest rates in the long end of the curve, taxable or tax-free, three to four foreign change. How much changes in your outlook when and if in our lifetimes, and we don't know how long or when, interest rates normalize to growth rates and inflation rates. There are plenty of studies that would argue that zero short-term interest rates do not last forever, and long-term borrowing rates of three and four percent do not last forever. We are enjoying a very unusual platform in the cost of capital. So I'm gonna ask each panelist in a lightning round, when the cost of capital changes, what changes in Arizona? Well, I'll go first. I, I think one of the problems we have right now is, you know, we have a hard time understanding how to leverage debt to our advantage. So one of the things when, when you hear those advantages, you have to take advantage of them. So obviously one of the things that I'd like to see us do while we're in this great situation is to do a better job at bonding and leveraging that position for infrastructure and community improvements. Um, I'm, a, I'm a cheap money kind of guy, I think. I think, uh, I, I don't know why we would ever change monetary policy that would reverse, reverse this trend, but I know there's um, 
guy smarter than me at the Fed that, that might do that. But it's been, it's been uh, a very important part of stabilizing the economy. It's been a very important part of giving export industries an opportunity to expand. Um, I, I think obviously a reverse in that would be negative to us. I'm not sure how negative it would be. Uh, I, I guess the negativity now would be why we haven't done more as a community to take advantage of this position you know, with a major infrastructure play. Those would be just my thoughts. And I would just add to that, I think that, you know, to Barry's point, that we, there's been tremendous opportunity, and I'm not sure that we've taken advantage of all of it, but I think it, we should stay focused on the things that we've put in place we've been, from, a, from a state perspective, <coughs> investments in business, and creating a really pro-business environment, and we've got to continue, even as we see um, potential growth and, and opportunity in our, in our near future, and and, and short-term, uh, medium-term um, future, we, we just can't rest on our laurels. And, I, and so I think in times like this, you just have to stay focused. You have to be really disciplined and diligent about uh, identifying what works and then try to make sure you stay ahead of that curve as we know things will change for sure. You know, from a Canadian point of view, uh, from the capital stack side of things, um, if that happens, uh, the Canadian guys are happy because they're going to be the capital that comes in that will be less expensive. Um, if U.S. does go down that road, which it will, um, and we're seeing this much movement right now at this moment in time, and that capital stack is FDI based outside of the United States, then that's where the point of origin for those spreads will be of interest. Thank you. Uh, one other policy question. We'll open it up because we need the last five minutes of this uh, session for a special purpose. The labor participation rate in the United States is down to a level that we haven't seen in approximately three decades. The rising number of people who are on permanent disability because of changes in law is accelerating. Everybody wants good, high-paying jobs. No matter where the Global Interdependence Center goes, we never have a panelist. I think Peter said this earlier, someone said, no one ever sat here and said, we are looking for entry level minimum wage jobs. Never heard that. In the employment structure of the United States, as the trends in place unfold, and the expectation is, let's assume, the labor participation rate continues to fall, how do you see your optimistic outlook for Arizona in these national circumstances which are beyond your control? Why don't we go in Kevin first? Sure. I, you know, my personal opinion is that um, the reason that those numbers are going in the wrong direction is, is, a, is a lack of commitment to education and, uh, and developing the kind of talent that we need to compete. So I think that's what's going to keep us ahead of the curve. That's what's going to revert, well, reverse the curve and get us out ahead again. And I think in the state of Arizona, we've got some tremendous academic institutions. We continue to uh, invest, albeit a little bit slower than I'd personally like in, in, in K through 12, but that's just my personal opinion. But I really believe it's going to be about an educated workforce that, that can compete in developing technologies that set us apart from, uh, from the competition. Barry? Well, I agree with Kevin. I think. I think uh, I haven't seen the most recent data, but if we just filled the jobs where we have the skills gap in the United States, uh, the recession would be over and we'd be fully employed. You know, so unemployment rates for software developers in the Valley is like 00015. Um, we probably could put 50,000 people to work immediately in greater Phoenix if we had more STEM graduates. So a lot of the, you know, people are talking about this gap, this equity gap that's going on. It's a skills gap problem that's reflected in equity. And uh, it's also affecting our competitiveness. So if you look right now in the greater Phoenix region, you know, about 45% of the engineers in this market are almost eligible for retirement. The average age of an engineer in greater Phoenix is 55. I'm 52, so that sounds like a young man to me or a young woman. But, you know, you're starting to get into near retirement ages at that. You're certainly losing the kind of energy that the high-tech companies are looking for. So we have to make a revolutionary commitment to STEM education in this market, and we have to make a major commitment 
to bolstering our engineering program. So in order for us to be in the top 10 in the United States, so everything we talk about in GPEC is how do we become number one? If we can't be number one in something, how do we get into the top 10? For us to be in the top 10 in the United States for engineering availability, we have to increase the amount of engineers in this market 18 times, 18 times. So um, I think we're averaging about 1,000 to 1,200 engineering graduates a year between our higher education community. And so as we turn right around and do, you know, so what we've done is we've had this tax and economic policy that's really advantaged us on export industries. And I'm sure Kevin would agree with me. I mean, we're gonna have all kinds of guys looking for talent that isn't here because of these skills gap issues. And that's ultimately gonna lead to dissatisfaction. The mining industry probably could use a lot of help in the robotic space. Intel is doing $500 million in research now in Chandler, which is a pretty big research number. They're looking for 300 engineers. They are now exclusively looking for that internationally. And we have to do a better job at addressing that locally. In the meantime, you know, Matt Salmon was here talking about comprehensive immigration reform, and we immediately moved to Dreamers and Latinos because of how important that is to us civically. I mean, opening up uh, the H-1B visas to uh, unlimited, uh, there's no reason for us not to give a visa to an engineer or a scientist to come to the United States. We shouldn't even have a cap on that activity. And that's going to be the next phase of our challenge in this market. You know, we've done a great job on tax and economic policy. We're very good at infrastructure. Now the next phase in this market is what are we going to do about the talent? And we need to support uh, Governor Brewer's efforts for Common Core in the legislature, which is going on right now. Glenn? I agree with uh, and echo with a lot of Barry said. I'm, I'm a huge uh, believer in vocational training. Mm -hmm. I think that we need to get our, uh, our workforce into making things again. All you have to do is take a look at Brazil and Mexico. Look at Mexico and look at Bombardier and what they have done in Mexico where they have taken a workforce, an agrarian workforce, and moved them into building planes. Not just planes, private jets that are some of the best jets in the world in a time frame that was this big. They moved their educated workforce into other areas and they took the, the, the rest of the people and they created vocational training and skills. What, was, what, what is wrong with being able to make something again in America? And that to me is one of the fundamental things that we need to get back to doing at a broader scale and a broader level. We watch an aerospace industry right now, specifically in the state of Arizona, which is primarily a military-based aerospace industry, when 70% of all growth in the aerospace industry is outside the United States in the commercial area. So that means you've got forces outside the United States that have energy costs and manufacturing costs wanting to near shore to North America, and we don't have that educated workforce at the right age that Barry's referring to, ready to go. And it's actually easier in northern Mexico and central Mexico to take a young Mexican and put that person into the workforce in the civil aviation side than it is here. And that's just, something's wrong with that on our side of the equation. It's good for the Mexican government, it's great for the Mexican people, but somewhere on our side of the equation in the state of Arizona, we have got to get that to where that works out properly. Thank you. We have time for a couple of questions. Briefly, so we can do a lightning round, sir. Can't hear you. Microphone was designed by the lowest bidder. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, so um, of course we all know that uh, American Airlines and U.S. Airways have merged. Now U.S. Airways is really no more at this point, except for the, the, the flags on the on the planes. I know Mayor Stanton was a big supporter of the merger. And he was hoping that American Airlines would, you know, open up some international markets from Europe and Asia, direct flights to, to Phoenix, which it's going to take time. We, we understand that. How, what do you on the panel see of the advantages of that? Do you think those flights will materialize, and will that help trade? Is that something that we really need to do to help trade and to help commerce in Arizona business? Yeah, I think, let me, we really didn't have a choice but to support that merger you know, unless we wanted to go out and, you know, make a run for the end zone with, you know, uh, by, by interfering with the, the exchange of that business. So there's a lot of conversations on the U.S. Airways, American Airlines merger, and 
uh, you know, just give a couple thoughts on that because I think that's an important conversation. I mean, we would have preferred, you know, U.S. Airways to be able to make it on their own and build our own hub around our own company, but that wasn't likely. Uh, there was a lot of uh, indications that there was going to be a major roll up, you know, in that industry. And what did U.S. Airways look like rolled up into another company? What did it look like with Delta? What did it look like with this company? And so the American Airlines was the best option among the market trend, and that's why we supported that. And at least, you know, not, you know, you're na we're all naive to think that Doug's in Dallas really thinking of us, but it's a nice thing to say. At least it's a bunch of Phoenix guys running the combined airline in Dallas, uh, and I'm sure they're thinking about us every day on how they can help us. Um, <laughs> so, um, so the problem on the, F on the direct, direct flights are pivotal to this FDI trade situation, but the challenge on that is, you know, that was part of the conversation. That was, you know, we're going to be officially the Western hub, but we still have the challenge of LAX, and it's 54 minutes away, and it's, you know, the California economy is massive, and so, you know, I'd like to see more direct flights. I think that will happen, but not nearly as quickly as I would hope. Any other comments on aviation? If, if I can add two cents into that. Please. I, I, I agree with what was just said, and let me give you an example of how you go around that. When we started our council approximately 10 years ago, we had 20 nonstop direct flights between Canada and Arizona a week. We now have 80. And um, you can go after other airlines and you can increase frequencies. And I, uh, I would love American to step to the plate, but uh, I'm not holding my breath. Another question, sir. Um, what can uh, we as a group uh, do to help defeat this uh, House Bill 1060 or 1062, as it's called, which will probably stifle business in Arizona? Well, I think we got to get Kevin to get the governor to veto that. <laughs> Kevin, are you officially on the point on that? I am on All right, that was a quick answer. Good. Kevin comment, Sullivan's going to put an end to the madness. I want everybody to come out of here saying that. <laughs> Any other comments? No. Well, that, I think you know, one of the things I think is important is, you know, you know send an email into the governor's office. I, you know, I feel pretty confident that, that she's going to veto that. I shouldn't say that, but I do. Um, she's very, been very wonderful to work with on the economy. But it's not too late. You know, she's, she's, she's a very careful um, uh, very careful and thoughtful on our policy decisions. So we're probably, you know, I don't know what we're gonna do, but we could have another day or two of her considering this, she's traveling. It would be nice if everybody put a letter into the office asking for the veto and then presented that on your website so that we can continue to have the voices going into the market that this is not a policy that's representative of Arizona. Um, a good way to end a panel is a applause from an audience on a call for action so why don't we stop, thank this panel, but I'm gonna ask them to remain seated for a reason you'll see in a moment. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm gonna turn this program back to Peter Gold. Thank you, David, and thank you uh, panel members for your outstanding insight. We uh, greatly appreciate it, and thank you audience for allowing us to deviate from our uh, published schedule for just uh, five minutes. But. Uh, an important event occurred here in Arizona very uh, recently, and uh, we took notice of it even back on the East Coast and uh, on the West Coast and the North Coast and South Coast uh, and in other parts of the world. And the Executive Committee of the Global Interdependence Center was uh, very, very much involved in uh, uh, this uh, uh, gesture. So uh, with your colleagues, uh, Glenn, on, on the panel there, I just wanted to note, and I'm sure they know, of course, and I'm sure many, many in, in the audience know that recently the uh, State Department has approved uh, Canada's nomination of Glenn uh, Williamson as Honorary Council of Canada for Arizona. So congratulations to Glenn for that. And I'd like to read a letter from uh, from our uh, chairman and from uh, me, one of our vice chairmans, to, to you, uh, Consul Williamson. Uh, please accept our best wishes and sincere congratulations on being appointed Honorary Council of Canada for Arizona. Your selection recognizes your valuable contribution to Arizona's significant role in international trade and development. 
in helping Arizona companies expand their relationships with their Canadian counterparts, cities, and organizations, you are contributing to Arizona's growing status as an important Western Hemisphere international business and cultural hub. Again, Glenn, congratulations on this appointment, which is important for Arizona and Canada, and you personify the very best of global interdependence. Okay, so with that, again, our thanks to the panel, and uh, we're going to take a, a very brief coffee break and reconvene in about five or ten minutes. Thank you very much.